It was, uh, it's interesting, Friday at uh, morning prayer, um, there, there continues to be a move at morning prayer. And uh, Mother Sarah uh, prayed something at the end of the prayer time, um, almost prophesying a move of God that's present. And uh, I always find when things are like that or prayed, I get very, very excited. And when I get excited like that, it seems like oppression comes against me. The enemy tries to distract me or deter me from what God is wanting to speak uh, to you all and, and, and even into my life. And uh, this morning as I was um, coming here, I just began to praise God and I just felt a release from those things and really heard the Lord speak a right now word, a, a, a prophetic word that I, I want to share with you guys today. But let, let's dive in firstly right into the scriptures, the meaning of the celebration of this Sunday. What, it, what is the, the meaning of this Sunday? And so if you've brought your Bible or you have your Bible at home, we're going we're gonna to start right in Acts 2. We're going to dive into what Pentecost means and what, what it represents. And in Acts 2, the first four verses are going to give us a really clear picture of what Pentecost is all about. And so as we share this today, I, I want you to know, just giving you some context and way, the way the service is going to go, we're going to move basically right through all of Acts 2 today, most of it at least. And we're going to talk about Pentecost and we're going to see two gifts that are being brought out from that. So today is our, our ascent kind of into the, the, the gifts of the Spirit and each individual gifts. And we have two gifts that we're going to address today. But I want to start with the Scripture in Acts 2 verses 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like a roaring violent wind came from heaven. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came into the rest of each of them, resting upon each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them to do so. And it's interesting because we see really in this chapter the fulfillment of God's promise of the Holy Spirit coming to rest in his people and that it would be a sign of things to come in the end times and that, that God would pour out his spirit upon on, on all people. And so as we move into these, these gifts this morning, it's important to remember what it is we're celebrating here. And I think we've done a great job of answering what the gifts are and how to use them. But here's, a, here's the bigger question. Why? Why the Holy Spirit? Why the gifts? I, I, I give you one answer. It's for the advancement of the gospel. Simply that. The advancement of the gospel. That's why we receive the Holy Spirit. That's why the gift of the Spirit exists. So that you don't operate in your own power and strength. But you operate in the authority and the power of Jesus Christ. Through which the Holy Spirit operates in you and through you. That's why. That's why these things are so important. So, so important. We know that as we've discussed each of the last previous four weeks and we enter into week five, today's message is entitled Communicating for a Change. Communicating for a Change. And so as we've discussed these gifts, we know that they exist to be a greater extension of love to both believers and unbelievers. If you're someone that's just started it, uh, tuning into this series, this is what we're saying the heart of the gifts represent. It's an extension of the Holy Spirit moving in us so that we can offer love to believers and unbelievers. And as the gifts operate in us, it reveals Christ. It reveals the evidence of Him being present in our lives and that people would see Jesus, not us, see him. And that is, that is only possible by the work of the Holy Spirit. And they are, the gifts are meant to build up the church, to strengthen the church, and bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ. We as individuals and in the formation of small groups this fall, we're welcoming these gifts so that we can grow also in the fruits of the Spirit. And as we grow in those things, we're, we're seeing a change in our community. Right? Not just a change in this building. The change has to come outside of the building and in the places that we live. That we would bring Jesus to the world. Really, really important to do so. 
What, what, what is really, let me give you some documentation of, uh, if you would want to know the history behind Pentecost and some of the things that it, that it represents. And we have said it's, it was for the advancement of the gospel. And you see the infilling of the Spirit in the first four verses there. I want you to know this, that Pentecost refers to a Christian celebration that is the dissension of the Holy Spirit on his disciples after Jesus ascended into heaven. All right? And that occurred 50 days after Resurrection Sunday. So that's the seventh Sunday after Resurrection Sunday that this happened. So 50 days in total, and it's 10 days that the Spirit descended upon people 10 days after Jesus' ascension into heaven. Okay? And so what's really interesting to me is that in the, the custom of this holiday... Right in the Jewish holiday, this festival, all right, Pentecost, is represented as the first harvest. Right, that's what's being celebrated in in, in the Jewish um, the Jewish custom is the festival of the first harvest. And I find it very interesting that on the same day as the spirit the spirit of God moves upon people and within them, there's a harvest. There's a first harvest. Of believers. We're going to see that later on in scripture, but I think it's just so important to know that there, there's a difference in, in talking about crops and Jesus is saying, no, there'll be a, there'll be a harvest of believers. There'll be a harvest of people that will come to know Jesus Christ. You can see that this is one of the three major holidays that's represented in Deuteronomy chapter 16. I believe it's verse 16 that those, those uh, festivals are, are listed. But it's important to know what it means in the full aspect of what Pentecost is. And it's the, like we said, the advancement of the gospel. So it goes forward. Let's move in Acts chapter 2 verses 14 to 21 here. And we really see what is going to happen uh, uh, immediately after the gift of the Holy Spirit is given to the people, it's poured out upon the people, we see really the first operation of two gifts being present. And, and I'm going to share something with you here in a minute, but I want you to see that the gifts start to move from this point, all right? So the gifts that we're talking about today start to move from the infilling of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 verses 14 to 21, and it says this, Then Peter stood with the eleven. That's the, that's the first line. Then Peter stood with the 11. I have, to, I have to share something with you today. There is so much division and hatred and violence in our world right now. Hear, hear what's being said here. Peter then stood with the 11. I, I, I have to share this with you. I believe that I received a prophetic word for you this morning. That it is time for the church to stand up together. I'm not talking about advancing an agenda. I'm talking about standing up and reaching the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not an agenda, but a person that we're proclaiming that the world would come to know. And here's what I believe the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, I'm actually operating in a time of grace right now. All this division that you're seeing is an opportunity for lukewarm Christians to decide who they stand with. I'm just telling you that. It's an opportunity. Uh -oh, which, which team are you on? Are you going to stand with violence of the world? Are you going to stand with racism? Are you going to stand with this? Are you going to stand with that? I believe what the Lord is trying to say, look, there's a move that's present. Look, last year we spoke about awakening. I'm telling you, awakening is happening right now. It's happening right now. But there's a grace period where the Lord is saying, are you with me or not? Are you with me or not? And it's really an operation of grace where he's saying to those that are playing both sides. Bill McCullough always used to say, when you put one foot on the boat and one foot on the bank, you usually end up in the water. And so I'm asking you this morning, are you in the boat or are you on the bank? Because here's really what's going to happen. This, this thing that, that we just sung about, a move of God, a revival, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. We may not know when, but it's going to happen. And when it does, I don't want you, out of the love of my heart, I don't want you to be left behind and wondering, well, what, where, what's going on? That, does, that has nothing to do with your salvation. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm saying you're just going to miss the move of God that you wanted to be a part of because you couldn't decide between the world and God. I'm just telling you, that is a, that is a hard word, but it's time, Christians. Where do you stand? Do you stand with Jesus or do you not? 
He's calling us into a deeper place. And it's important to remember that. So, I mean, that's, I'm sorry I got derailed there, but I really needed to share that with you. That's literally the first line of this passage. Peter stood with the other believers. Church, stand with the other believers. Stand and proclaim the gospel that others would receive. He then said this. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd. He said, fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem... Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people, he's talking about the people that were speaking in tongues. They're bystanders saying, well, these people are drunk. And he's saying, no, they're not. He says this. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. So this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. He says this, that in the last days, God will pour out his spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men and will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And the servant and your servants, both men and women alike, will pour, he will pour his spirit out upon them in those days and they will prophesy. Look, I'm, I'm just telling you this. Every week at morning prayer in this place, different people are prophesying about the move of God that is coming. And so these words are being fulfilled. These words are being fulfilled. We got to, we got to, what we said last week, move towards the move. It's, it's time to get ready to move. He's going to call his people. Here we go. I will show you wonders in heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood, fire, and billows of smoke. The sun will turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. He's coming back. He's coming back. It's time to be ready. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's literally what Kevin just prayed. Look, look, here's this. The scripture says that the kingdom of God is at hand. That's not then, that's not now. I mean, it's now. It's now. This isn't six steps to get yourself ready for the best spiritual life you can have next month. No, I'm saying that the kingdom of God is now. It is at hand. And so we're called to be ready, ready to move, ready, ready to move into action, prepared. Just what he prayed, that I'm a resident of, king, of the kingdom of God. I'm a citizen in that kingdom. And so when other kingdoms rise and fall, because this earthly kingdom will fall, where will you stand? You know, I'm convinced that persecution came against the early church because the gospel was moving forward. It was moving out and moving forward. And I don't, I don't mean this to be offensive, but I'm just saying this. When, when things start to happen now, the church is seeing it as a polite place where people pl- pray for things that are going on in the world from a distance. I'm not saying that we stand up and yell and chant a, 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 an agenda. I'm saying stand up and call the world to come to Jesus. Call your friends. You can't tell me in the last five weeks something hasn't begun to stir in your heart that you're calling deeper, being called deeper into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's wanting to draw other people into this because you have a love. The love of Christ lives in your heart because it's there. You desire for others to come to know Jesus. So important that we move into this move. The kingdom of God is at hand. I I want you to know this. As I was preparing this, look, you all know that this sermon series has been prepared months in advance. All right, so when I decided to talk about these two gifts on this Sunday, I had no idea that this Sunday was going to be Pentecost Sunday. And so in the accuracy of the scripture and the way it's represented in the Christian calendar, on this Sunday, we're going to be talking about two gifts, teaching and exhortation. Y'all, Peter just offered teaching and exhortation. And so we're going to move through these scriptures and what Peter is preaching and teaching and his exhortation and talk about these things. Let's just do this as we go forward. Let's let's just ask the Lord to allow us to take a step further in his word this morning. God, we just ask right now as we move further into your word that you would call us 
boldly into your throne room, Lord, that we would receive your instruction, your command to go and be bold witnesses to the uttermost parts of the world, God, to even here in our community, to our families, Lord, that as we receive these words from Peter and from your holy word, God, that we would move into action just as you call us to do so. Father, thank you. Bless these words in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Teaching and exhortation. The first one, teaching. Teaching. Hmm. To accurately, defining this, to accurately make plain is how I would define that. This is a person who can take the word of God and make it accurate, accurately plain for others that they may understand what is being said in scripture. The simple, simple gift of teaching. I'm not talking about the office of teacher. I'm talking about the gift of teaching to make plain so that others could understand the word. We're going to see Peter do this in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 28. Moving a little forward here in what we were just reading. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. And it's important to, to note this. He's saying there was a group of people that noticed that he was different, that he was the son of God because of the signs, wonders, and miracles that he performed. The Bible also says that a wicked, wicked and adulterous people demand a sign. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying you knew him because he did signs, wonders, and miracles. He's not saying it's a, a wrong thing, but I'm just... <coughs> Excuse me. I'm just saying that there will be in this move of God that's coming, there will be a group of people that will come to know Jesus Christ because of signs, wonders, and miracles. I'm just telling you, it happened then, it will happen again. It's the fact that people are drawn by those things. And as they come, we have to be responsible not just to present signs, wonders, and miracles, but to present the gospel. To present the love of Jesus Christ. That people would come to a saving relationship with Jesus. But because of his Holy Spirit that is poured out upon all mankind. That we operate in those gifts. And signs, wonders, and miracles may happen. That in this move that will come. We would lead people to Jesus Christ. Not to the signs, wonders, and miracles. But he's just saying, look, people noticed that he was different because of those things. And so when they happen again, make sure that you point them to Jesus. So important that we do that. Which God did among you. He's talking, he said, he did these things when he was among you. And as you yourselves know, you knew him by these things. And this man was handed over. Here's, here's a really important point to see when Peter, what Peter's saying here. Exhortation, we'll get to it, but there's a, there's a hint of exhortation here, an urging or a charge, all right? There's a charge here. There's a charge here. He says, you handed him over to God deliberately and had plans that were foreknowing, and you were the ones who helped the wicked men put to death this man on a cross. There's a, there's a charge there, right? Exhortation is this motivation or this urge to change, to change. And Peter is saying that, look, I'm just telling you, you we're, we're all responsible for putting him on the cross. And because of that, you, you should turn from those things. He said, but God was raised, raised him from the day, dead, raised Christ from the dead and freed him. From the agent of death. Because of this, it was impossible for death to keep him held down. Peter says this then. And this is a really important point because this is really going to speak to what we're talking about. Making plain the, the teaching. The teaching gift here. He said, David said about him. All right. So Peter is referring to David's word, which, was, which is in the scriptures. He says, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he was at my right hand, and I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices. My body also rests in hope, because you will not abandon me from the realm of the dead. You will not let the Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life, the way to live you will fill me with joy in your presence. Look, here's a key point about the gift of teaching. This is so huge. 
It is oftentimes that the word can be made plain by other accounts in Scripture. You're, look, look at this. You're not mustering your own words. You're pulling from the word. Come on now, that's teaching. That's the gift of teaching in its best form. Not just your opinion about the word. But Peter said, no, I'm telling you this to be true. And to make it even more plain for, me, for you, I'm going to let you know what King David said about this time where Jesus would be put on the cross, but death wouldn't hold him down. He would actually joy to my life. He would lead me away from death that I would choose him and find life, life everlasting. And that's what he's saying. Look, this was already said before. There is a greater opportunity to live because of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. And so in the teaching gift, it can be made plain by finding other scriptures that speak the words that you may not be able to speak yourself. How do I use this gift? How do I use the gift of teaching? I'm going to give you five things here this morning about using the gift of teaching. Number one, you can use it in a one-on-one discipleship setting. You can use this gift in a one-on-one discipleship setting, meaning a brother or sister in Christ that you study the word with. Someone that may be a new Christian that, that has questions about the word of God, you can teach them by using your gift of teaching that the Holy Spirit has given you, given you to teach in one-on-one disciple each other or other people. And so there's, number one, a great way to use that gift. Number two, Small groups. Look, there, to me, there's no greater discussion about the Word of God when there are 10 or 12 different perspectives represented and everyone's got a different opinion or has you know, thoughts about what's being read or, or discussed and somehow the Holy Spirit speaks through you and settles the argument or the discussion that's happening saying, no, this is what the Scripture means. This is what is to be made plain. This is what is to be seen. And so you who have a gift of teaching, you have the opportunity to share that gift in a discipleship setting, and also in a small group setting. It's a great and wonderful thing. Third thing would be in youth ministry. You can use this in youth ministry. Look, I'm just saying with young, young kids, just give them nuggets. Give them glimpses of things. I'm not saying that you have to explain a virgin birth. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying you can tell young kids about the love of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made on the cross for them. And I realize the fact now that I've said virgin birth, you may have to now explain that. I'm sorry for that. But maybe, but here's the reality. It's probably better that they hear it from you than from someone else. It's probably better that they hear it from you. So you can use this in youth ministry. Two more this morning on this topic and gift of teaching. Number four, women's and men's ministry. Right? There's such an opportunity in, in retreats or getaways or, or gatherings where women come together and pray or, or men have a discussion about the Bible. I mean, both those things happen here at our church. And then those are great opportunities to just see uh, uh, an opportunity to counsel or to go deeper in the teaching uh, uh, of people that you have like-minded with. This with. I mean, think about that. Iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. That's what the word says. And so when there's an opportunity for men to hold each other accountable through the word of God, by teaching, there's, there's such a great opportunity there for the gift of teaching to be displayed. Finally, social media. Social media. If, the word, if you read the word and something is made plain to you, and you receive revelation about the Scripture, here's what I know. People are excited about what they learn in the Scripture, but they don't feel confident enough to share because here's what, here's what we've done. This is, this, is, this is a poor thing that's happened. I believe that people feel fearful of sharing because if what they're sharing is not earth-shattering, then somehow it's not good enough to share. Hello, you are sharing from the Word of God. It's good enough to share. So shame on us where we've, we've said, well, if, it, if it's not this miraculous thing that's being shared about the work, word, of, uh, word of God on social media, then somehow it doesn't qualify for being shared. Look, share it. 
There are people that will listen to you. There are people that you can reach that pastors and ourselves can't reach. They need to hear from you. They need to see your faith on display. They need to see you make a declaration of faith and saying, this is what I received from the word of God and this is what it's done for my life. You have a platform. It's okay to share. Share the word of God. I I, I need you to know this. This is not a pastor thing. Teaching is not a pastor thing. You want to know how I know? Because of the word of God. The gifts of the spirit are for everyone. The offices, which are apostles, evangelists, pastors, teachers, those, those offices, those people are called. Okay? There's a difference there. The gifts are for everyone. The offices are for people that are called. And so it's important that you share your gift. It's so important that you do this. Like, like, I mean, think about this. You have the opportunity. This may happen. You may operate in your gift and share a word of teaching with someone that may not know that they're being called to an office. And because you shared with them, They receive what they needed to receive from God because the Lord spoke through you because you allowed him to use you and they move into their calling. And that's powerful. You just don't know who you're reaching. And so this morning is all about, as we've said, the sermon title is communicating for a change. And I I want you to know this. Communicating for a change is all about coming alongside. What do I mean by that? It's all about coming alongside people, being there with people, experiencing, having relationship with people. That's where the change happens. And so as we talk about the gift of exhortation this morning, I want you to know that that gift is simply defined as to encourage, to encourage, to, emo- to motivate. We've even said to urge, to charge. But the, the exhortation is that you would encourage, that you would, uh, that you would be there to motivate and to move people forward in the difficult times that they may be facing or, or just stand with them during those times. It's so important that we do that. I want you to know this. This is so cool to me. This is one of the things that, that I had seen this week and, and I felt that it was just something worth sharing. In the Greek, exhortation is defined as parokaleo, okay? Parokaleo, K-A-L-E-O, parokaleo, which means, exhortation in the Greek means parokaleo, which means to come alongside. Now, here's the really cool part. In Greek, the Holy Spirit is called the paraclete, the paracletos, which means to come alongside. Oh, that's cool. That's really cool. The one that comes alongside of you, within you, calls you alongside of others to encourage others. I mean, there's a coming alongside to then come alongside. I mean, that is a beautiful thing that we have to see that's represented in Scripture that we're called to. And here's what I know about exhortation. Exhortation encourages the heart to change. A transformation and an encouragement that, that, that wants change or, or urges change, not, not just on the surface but in the heart that per, a person would change. How do I know this? Because we see this represented in Scripture in a heart change that happens in Acts 2, verses 37 to 41. We continue with what Peter is saying. So Peter has addressed the people that are, that are there, and he's speaking, and he's preaching, and they speak to him. This is so cool. They speak to him and say, when the people had heard this, they were cut in their hearts. And said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Man, exhortation offered in a way where people come running and say, What should I do? How do I change? This is not just the the power of words. This is the power of the Holy Spirit coming alongside people. To create a heart change in their lives and in our lives. 
And so Peter replies to them. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I had a hard time when I was reading that this week because I think when you're so direct nowadays in the society that we live in, when you're so direct about what needs to be done, if someone was to come to you and say, what am I supposed to do? And we were to say, you need to repent. You need, you need to be forgiven. When you say that now in these type of times, it's seen as judgment or criticism. I'm just telling you, this is being seen as encouragement because they are, their hearts are in a place where they're ready to receive. And because they're ready to receive, when he says that to them, he says, you need to be forgiven. You need to seek repentance. You need to seek the Lord and let your heart be changed that you would receive the Holy Spirit. They receive it in that moment. And he goes on to say, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many others, he warned them with many words and he pleaded with them. He said this to them. He said, save yourselves from this corrupt generation I, this is, this is the, I, I mean, I don't even need to preach. This is what the word is saying this morning. Save yourselves from a corrupt generation, from a time where people are running here and running there and not standing from the Lord. Save yourself because you're being called into something different. Repent, turn from your wicked ways. Let the Lord save you. And so he says, those who accepted that day, that day, the very first day of the church, okay, where the, 12, where the new 12 were and the possibly the 120 that are there and the, the Spirit comes on that very day when they were baptized, there were about 3,000 people that were added to the church on the very first day of the church. Can I just say this? We're raising up the next generation of believers. I'm not talking about age. I'm talking about spiritual age. We're raising up. There's an opportunity before us to raise up the next generation of believers. I mean, in Romans 12, it tells us those who have the gift of teaching, teach well. Those who have the gift of encouraging, encourage well. That's what it says. I mean, think about this. What if we communicated for a change in our own lives? We came alongside people and we taught, and we, and we shared, and we encouraged. Could you imagine if, if it was true of our lives where the scripture says, and their number was added to daily, right? What if we came out of this series, and in 2020, we said their number was added to daily? Man, Holy Spirit, come. Fill us for your work. And the beauty of it all is you never know who you're reaching, you just don't know. You just don't know who you're reaching. I, I was reading this week about a story in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. November, first week of November. Yeah, 1934. Young man is about 15, 16 years old. And uh, there was a revival meeting, tent meeting happening in Charlotte at that time. And they were about three weeks into this revival meeting. And uh, this particular young man was not accustomed to those things. He kind of thought they were silly and didn't really want to go. But his, his family was, was uh, very devout believers in Christ. And uh, his, his dad actually only had a third, third grade education. And he just follow the Lord with all his heart, soul, and strength. And he, he told his son, you know, it's important that you go and, and hear this man speak. And so after about three weeks of this revival, this Tim meeting happening, he decides to go and hear this Dr. Ham speak. And when he's there, he said, I never will forget that that night the man was speaking about the love of God. And he said, as he was speaking about the love of God, it was doing something to my heart. 
And at the end of the meeting, he gave a, a call for those that wanted to come and give their life to the Lord to come. And he said, I felt something pulling me. And he, I said, I went, he went up to the altar and he knelt down. And he said, as I got there, when I got there, he said, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to pray. I didn't know what to say. And he said, just as about my, just as about my flesh was about to make me leave the stage because it was just pointless for me to be here. He said, I remember one of my family members coming, along, com coming alongside and saying to me, why are you here? And he said, I, I, I believe I'm supposed to give my life to Jesus. And that family member prayed with that young man right there. That young man left that day and probably didn't know at that point in time that his life would be forever different. That man's name was Billy Graham. And that man reached over 215 million people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only reason I tell you that story is because you may not know who you're reaching. And when your gift calls and the Lord moves you into position be obedient to the call that he's calling you into. I mean, think about that. The war, I mean, 215 million people because someone came alongside him and prayed a prayer of salvation. And that man was then called into an office as an evangelist and a prophet. I need you to know this. You're coming alongside you got, you got to receive this. You have to, I'm telling you, you have to receive this. Your coming alongside will far outlive any sermon I'll ever preach. Can you tell me what was preached this, this time last year on this very Sunday? I can't tell you either. I don't know. I don't remember. But let me tell you this. People do remember when you come alongside when their husband or their wife or their grandpa or their grandpa or their son or their daughter pass away and you come alongside and you're there for them and you pray with them, people remember that. People remember when they aren't sure what to pray but they know they need a relationship with Jesus Christ and you come alongside of them and pray a prayer that leads them to the Lord. They remember that. People remember when you take the time to disciple them and share with them and come alongside them in their emotion and their pain. Look, here's what I know, and I know this has been said many a times, but we have to hear this. People will not remember what you say. They will remember how you make them feel. And the only way that that is achieved is by coming alongside. Look, this, this is, you, you, those, those of us you want to call on revival, that, that's it right there. Come alongside other people. Share the gospel. Use your gift. Use your gift. Reach people that, that are lost. The desire to be found. Come alongside. Communicating for a change is about coming alongside. Those of you that have the gift of teaching, teach well. Those of you that have the gift of exhortation or encouragement, encourage well. If you say today, well, those aren't my gifts, then encourage those that do have those gifts to use them. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for today. We ask, Lord, that as we move into this response time, that we would be yielded and surrendered to you. God, many may not know this, but revival has broken out in Glenville, West Virginia. 24 churches and four pastors speaking a night. And Lord, we pray that whatever fire is being stirred there, would move here in our midst. And so, Lord, may we be a people that during this time come alongside one another 
not just as believers, but we would come alongside those who are hurting, who are struggling, that we would be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. This is only possible by your spirit, Lord. We thank you that you allowed us to receive it as we give our lives to surrender to you. Father, I echo the words of Pastor Kevin. I am a, king, I am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So Father, may we declare that today. May we walk from this place in boldness and the stirring of fire from within us, Lord. And Lord, as Ashley prepares to, to sing about the filling of the Holy Spirit, may we invite your filling in this place. God, I pray that in the last five weeks, Lord, as we started this series talking about how much do we desire to be filled, we move from a, a thimble to a glass to a bucket to a barrel. Lord, we pray today that you would increase our capacity to receive more of you. So God, in this moment, on this Pentecost Sunday, we pray, Lord, change our vessel size, that we would be filled to the overflow, God, creating us a new heart, Lord, that we would repent and turn from our wicked ways, God, that we would be drawn into the kingdom of God today, Lord, that we would seek you and that we would find you, Lord, that we would desire to know you and we would find you in these moments today, Lord. It's a time of urgency, God. We have to move forward, step forward like Peter did, God, and cry out and say, come out of the way of the world. Come out of her and move into the family of God. If you're someone that's at home and you're just tired of the race that you're running, look, I know, I can sense it right down in my own spirit that there are young people here right now that are tired of their way of life. And I'm just telling you today, come out of the world's systems. Come out of it. Come and choose Jesus Christ. Be done with the partying. Be done with the drinking. Be done with the sexual immorality. Be done with those things. Come, have peace that surpasses all understanding. Come, joy, have joy that is everlasting this very day. Surrender your life to Jesus. Start over today. Say, Lord, I'm done chasing those things. Here I am. See me. Change me. Make me whole this very day, I pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, God, we thank you. Move upon our hearts transform our minds and fill us with your spirit we pray in jesus name amen and amen